welcome back to high school history uh, starting today i'm going to try and cover all the chapters of your class 12 curriculum themes in indian history so we will start today with theme one which is called bricks beads and bones which deals with the harappan civilization so the chapter begins with a quick discussion on how do we name the civilization for the longest time it was called the indus valley civilization because most of the early sites were found along the uh, river indus uh, but uh, in recent decades, we have found many more large Harappan sites which are very far away from the Indus Valley. Uh, scholars have now argued that uh, Indus Valley civilization is a very narrow definition uh, of the extent of the civilization. And they have uh, mostly now chosen to call it the Harappan civilization uh, after the first site which was discovered. Uh, we also know of many pre or early Harappan cultures in the same geographical region as where we find the Harappan uh, sites as well. Uh, as uh, archaeologists have studied these sites further, uh, many of these cultures prior to the mature Harappan phase uh, have thrown up unique pottery and artifacts. So definitely they were, uh, they cannot be classified as, you know, the Harappan um, civilization uh, sites since their artifacts are quite different from that of the mature Harappan phase. Uh, these sites also show very small settlements and almost no large buildings which come to classify or uh, represent uh, the mature Harappan phase. We also have a lot of evidence of abandonment of these early um, sites uh, and um, you know when we look at a lot of fires um, and maybe you know the sites were just burnt down to be resettled again. We then move on to subsistence strategies uh, and a quickly look at a list of important crops and animals which were consumed as food. Um, so we have archaeobotanists who have studied plant remains and have told us that uh, there have been remains of charred grain and seeds like barley, millets, wheat, lentils, sesame uh, and chickpea. Uh, but rice finds are quite rare. Um, even if uh, you look at um, agricultural practices today in um, uh, you know, in the Punjab and Sindh region, it's largely wheat that is cultivated, uh, not so much rice. Uh, regarding animal food, archaeo um, zoologists tell us that uh, they have found bones of cattle, goat, buffalo, sheep, pig, fish and fowl bones. They've also found bones of wild species such as boar, deer and gharial. Now, how do we know that they may have been used for food? Uh, archaeo zoologists tell us that uh, when they look at the cut marks on the bones, that uh, uh, gives them a hint uh, as to whether these were eaten or they were just, uh, you know, uh, hunted for sport. Uh, when we come to ar uh, agricultural technology, since the Harappan civilization seems to have been largely agrarian in nature, uh, much of the information is largely extrapolated. So whether the seeds were hand-sown or were they broadcast, we can't really say. But uh, we definitely have seals which show bulls and oxen which were probably used to plow the soil. We definitely have evidence of the plow in the form of terracotta toy plows uh, found in uh, many of the Harappan sites. We also have evidence of plowed field in Kali Bangan. Um, and we have two sets of furrows in Kali Bangan cutting each other at right angles, which hint at uh, double cropping. That is, they were perhaps growing two crops at the same time on the same piece of land. Then we come to irrigation. Uh, we have remains of canals in Shor Tughai, Afghanistan, but we have none in Punjab. So either those canals are lost to us because of silting over, or maybe they used well uh, irrigation, or perhaps, uh, you know, the large network of rivers uh, in this region perhaps was enough uh, to irrigate all the fields. We've also found uh, evidence of reservoirs in uh, Dhola Vira. So perhaps tank uh, irrigation or reservoir irrigation was also popular in some of the uh, more arid regions of uh, the Harappan civilization. Again, as far as harvesting tools are concerned, we can only guess because we've not found any remains of sickles. So perhaps they were using stone blades set in wooden handles to, uh, you know, harvest the crop. We now come to Mohenjo-daro and that being a planned city, we have seen two levels, which is actually a characteristics of most Harappan sites. So there is an uh, upper town, which is called the citadel, which is higher, but smaller. It is walled. Did it house the elite? Well, that's something uh, which remains uh, open to interpretation. Uh, and these citadels are not on natural mounds in most cases. Uh, in most cases, the citadels are actually built on man-made mud brick platforms. 
So imagine millions of bricks being made and hundreds if not thousands of workers you know laying out these bricks to create um, a platform then also we have the lower town which are much larger but uh, they are also walled did this house the commoners again uh, something that we are not entirely sure of we then come down uh, to the laying of drains this is a very important question which keeps coming in the board examinations um, and you are asked to talk about you know the various features uh, of uh, the drainage system of the Harappans. So we see that most of the drains are along roads and streets. Uh, we find that domestic waste was draining into these street drains. Most of the time these drains are covered with limestone sl slabs or bricks. And we also have evidence of these drains being regularly desilted or cleaned up because we have these little piles of refuse which are found alongside drains. These drains most likely emptied out in cesspits outside of the city limits. Then we come to domestic architecture. Most of the houses we see are built around a central courtyard which has an open roof. This courtyard may have been used for a lot of domestic uh, group work, for example, cooking or um, you know, grinding of spices and so on. Many houses we have found may have had two or more stories. How do we know that? Because we have remains of some staircases as well. Uh, largely the superstructures have all been destroyed, perhaps because they were made of uh, wood and um, maybe uh, you know some leaf coverings or something or wood uh, ceilings which have long since collapsed and disintegrated. Again we see that there are no windows on the outer wall so perhaps uh, they were concerned with uh, concern, uh, concerned with uh, you know privacy issues which is why uh, they would not have any windows on the outer wall so that people cannot peep into their homes. Most of the houses we also see that they have their own brick paved bathrooms um, the brick paving is done very effectively so uh, largely the floors are sort of uh, you know quite waterproof um, in a sense and each of these bathrooms has a drain which is connected to the street drains so that's also very very interesting that all the refuse water of the homes uh, comes out into the street drains many homes also had wells in the outer rooms which are close to the entrance uh, perhaps for passers-by to access and draw some drinking water uh, so this is also a very um, interesting phenomenon that we do not see in a lot of other civilizations. Coming to the citadel, the structures that we have are of a public nature. We do not uh, see a lot of domestic uh, uh, structures there. We have structures like warehouses and granaries. In Mohenjo-daro in particular, we have uh, the Great Bath, which perhaps was used for ritual purposes. So were these cities planned? Yes, they were very much planned. And if you get a question on this, uh, these might be some of the points that um, you can talk about that all building activities was limited to the platforms that were being built in the upper and the lower towns uh, we really don't have uh, you know unplanned uh, uh, you know unregulated growth of buildings like you see in uh, you know cities uh, in india today uh, the roads all intersect at right angles so it's a grid pattern um, so naturally you know there was a group of people who perhaps sat down and you know drew up blueprints uh, which would indicate planning as well. We, of course, have a very, very well-developed drainage system. Uh, no other civilization which is contemporary to the Harappan actually shows uh, any um, uh, concern with uh, drainage issues. All of this also shows massive mobilization of labor. Hundreds, thousands of uh, you know, masons and other laborers were being uh, used to um, you know, construct these uh, amazingly large uh, cities. And what is also very interesting is the standardized brick size ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 4. So if height was one unit, the width was two units of that and the length was four times that of the height. Uh, so whatever may be the size of the bricks, they may be small bricks or large bricks, but every brick, whether they are baked bricks or sun-dried bricks or fired bricks, uh, they are all of the same standardized ratio. So all of these points go on to prove that uh, the Harappan cities were very, very well planned. Coming to tracking social differences. So did the Harappan civilization uh, have social stratification? Uh, of course, yes. Um, much of it is, of course, um, extrapolated. And we have a few points which kind of uh, give us a hint as to um, Harappan society being um, hierarchical. Uh, so the first thing that we look for is burials. Now, if you look at, uh, you know, some of the other civilizations, like the Egyptian, for example, uh, you know, the royalty were buried in these um, very elaborate and huge 
tomb complexes, um, which obviously mark them out as very special people who were buried in them. But when we look at the Harappan context, we really don't have such a huge difference um, in burials. Largely, they are pit burials. Some of the burials, uh, you know, graves are lined with bricks. So that may indicate that um, those who were brick lining their uh, burials were perhaps, you know, more uh, uh, richer people than those who were just laid out in regular uh, pits. We also have grave goods that we find in the burials, which may indicate some sort of social stratification. Um, for example, when we look at the pottery, jewellery, you know, how much has been put in or perhaps uh, how fine is the pottery or how precious is, uh, is the jewellery, that may indicate some level of social stratification. But largely in Harappa, we do not notice, uh, you know, uh, the kind of opulent um, uh, burials like we uh, have in China or in Egypt. The second thing which helps us track social differences is looking for luxuries. Um, so when we have, um, you know, different kinds of products, for example, some products seem to be like luxury items. Um, Fion spots are uh, quite unique in that sense. Uh, they're a kind of a, um, you know, pre-glass thing. Uh, these spots are quite small, so maybe they were used to store uh, some very precious uh, items, uh, for example, perfumes maybe. Um, you know, or or um, some makeup product, we don't know, right? And because we don't have a lot of fire on spots, uh, largely, uh, um, you know, archaeologists believe that these were special luxury items. Uh, not only that, fire on production um, use a fairly complex technique as well. So again, when the technique gets complex, your product gets more expensive to produce, and therefore they are termed as luxury items. There are many other items made of precious or semi-precious material like jewelry made of gold or lapis lazuli or carnelian etc so they are all termed as luxury items so uh, obviously there was a class uh, within the society which could afford these luxury products we have many other uh, items that we find of everyday use like needles combs pottery querns etc now the question that some of the archaeologists have asked is what about daily use items that may be made of expensive raw materials for example, needles made of um, ivory or bronze combs or very fine pottery, right? So what of that? So I would say that uh, this again goes on to prove that there was some social stratification uh, among the Harappan people. There could be some other additional points uh, which you could use for tracking social differences. One would be area of uh, residence. So if you are living in the upper town, you are perhaps part of the city elite. So naturally you'll be more powerful and uh, you obviously would have more access to wealth and another point could be different occupations now obviously we see any um, you know social group any cultural group uh, all of them cannot be practicing the same occupation and we know that different occupations also attract different kinds of incomes um, so maybe the head mason uh, earns more than just a laborer who's laying out the bricks one on top of the other uh, maybe um, you know those who are making those who are bead workers are perhaps poorer than perhaps those who are trading in those uh, bead jewelry right so these could be some additional points that you use uh, to write an answer on tracking social differences for this chapter then we go on to finding about craft production now first um, we look at there are a variety of crafts being practiced in the Harappan context like bead making, bangle making, pottery of different kinds, metal working, shell cutting, etc. A large variety of met, uh, material are also being used for these different crafts. For example, we have a lot of shell work, uh, we have a lot of copper uh, work being done, bronze of course, since this is a bronze age civilization. We have carnelian, lapis and many other such precious and semi-precious stones. We've got steer type beads, you know, a whole lot of uh, different materials that are being used for various crafts. Uh, we also see a lot of different shapes and designs and techniques of production being used uh, in uh, in all of these different craft um, uh, uh, making uh, industry. Now, how do we identify centers of craft production? Now, this is also a question that may come in the exam. So, um, you may find raw materials in that place, right? Uh, you may find some remains of tools, maybe broken ones unfinished objects um, you may find and also waste products so for example you have made shell bangles there'll be much of the shell that you've carved away from uh, the raw material and that would be waste product so when you have a collection of a lot of waste product in a particular area you may quite safely assume that this was a center of craft production for example in Balakot and Nageshwar 
uh, we find a lot of shell objects. So we are assuming that these two centers uh, were, um, you know, homes to um, shell um, uh, craft industries. And we also have uh, finished products which are obviously being sent to centers around the civilization and beyond, which also proves that uh, there were hundreds of different crafts being practiced um, in the Harappan civilization. Now, how did they procure raw materials? Now, we have evidence of two kinds of routes that people used. Overland routes, which may be evidenced by, you know, toy carts that we found, and riverine or coastal sailing. Uh, we have um, a lot of... Um, uh, seals which represent uh, boats and ships with sails um, which give us that uh, you know hint now how materials procured from the subcontinent and beyond um, there were perhaps two major ways of doing that one was establishing settlements so in Nageshwar and Balakot for example um, you know settlements was established to procure shell uh, and not only procure that raw material but also craftsmen working with shell in these two sites then we of course have settlements in Shotugai perhaps to uh, get their hands on lapis lazuli which is quite commonly found there. Uh, another strategy would be you know uh, sending expeditions uh, for example in Khetri in Rajasthan to acquire copper, uh, to South India to acquire gold. Uh, why we say expeditions is because when we look at Khetri and South India uh, the settlements that we found uh, there we do not have uh, much Harappan artifacts there. We do have artifacts which are of a quite different nature uh, than that of the Harappan. So we believe that the Harappans were sending expeditions there to, um, you know, um, set up trade links with the people living in Khetri and in South India. We also have evidence of long distance trade, uh, especially with Oman and Mesopotamia. Uh, we, uh, a, 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 much of the copper that we have found in the Harappan civilization has traces of nickel. And uh, we also have some Mesopotamian copper, which also has traces of nickel. So perhaps Oman uh, was um, exporting uh, copper to both uh, Harappa and Mesopotamia. In Oman, we've also found Harappan jars uh, with, um, you know, um, uh, perhaps which were carried, which were used for carrying liquids. Now, what liquid we have not yet been able to figure out, but uh, the very uh, existence of Harappan jars in uh, Oman also establishes the fact that uh, the Harappans and the Omanese people were trading with each other. When we look at Mesopotamian texts, we have mentions of Dilmun, which is perhaps Bahrain, uh, Magan, maybe another name for Oman, and Meluha, which we are assuming would be the Harappans um, uh, area. Now, uh, we've also find, found Harappan seals uh, in the Mesopotamian uh, region, and many of the Harappan weights and beads have also been found there. Mesopotamian texts also mention the uh, the Haya bird. Is the Haya bird the peacock? Well, uh, it's only ex extrapolated evidence and we don't know for sure. Coming to seal scripts and weights, very, very important if you are looking at a commercial economy as well. So uh, we have found seals and the impressions of these seals, which are called sealings, on clay bits. Perhaps these clay bits were used to uh, seal um, the products which were being uh, exported so that the person who received the products would know if the seal wasn't broken that the products has, have not been tampered with. Uh, we also have an enigmatic script of the Harappans because we have not been able to uh, decipher it so far. Some scholars have claimed that they have deciphered but most other scholars do not agree um, on this point. Uh, but what we do know for sure is that the Harappan script has almost 400 symbols. It was perhaps written from right to left. Now, um, how we can guess that is when you look at the seals, you see that the spacing between the, the characters and the characters are very well formed on the right hand side. But as you move to the left, uh, uh, the writing tends to get very cramped, uh, right? So uh, this has uh, prompted scholars to believe that the script was perhaps written from right to left. Most inscriptions, in fact, all inscriptions are very short, uh, not like the long inscriptions that we find in Mesopotamia, like you studied in 11th, but very, very short inscriptions. Perhaps this is also a challenge in uh, trying to uh, decipher the Harappan script. Uh, the script we have found on many different surfaces, like on pottery rims, on seals, we found them on tools, on jewelry, in fact, even on bone. 
so does that mean that literacy was widespread did many more people know how to read and write again when we ask this question we really don't have any answer to that coming to weights all weights were made of the stone called chert they were all cubical in uh, structure they have no markings but the denominations are binary uh, the smaller denominations at least so they go 2 4 8 um, I missed a number, should have been 16 and then 32 and 64, right? So it kind of uh, keeps doubling uh, right up to 12,800 units. The higher denominations follow a decimal system. We've also found metal scale pans, uh, which kind of gives us a hint as to what kind of scales uh, they may have used for measuring uh, weights. What is interesting is that the smaller units may have been used to measure, you know, precious and semi-precious stones, uh, gold and silver perhaps and the high denominations may have been used to measure out you know grain or meats and so on heavier stuff ancient authority what kind of political system uh, did the harappans have i mean did they even have a political system now let's look at uh, the harappan civilization and try to make a guess now when we look at the civilization it indicates that a lot of complex decisions were being made um, for example, we have a uniformity of Harappan artifacts, for example, which is evident in pottery, in seals, weights, in, uh, you know, the, the uh, measures, uh, mo most notably bricks, right? Even though we know that the bricks were not being produced in any single center, wherever we found Harappan settlements and we've looked at the bricks right from the Jammu region in the north uh, to Gujarat, we see that it was a uniform ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 4, right? Um, <clears throat> whether they were sun-dried bricks or they were baked or fired bricks, all of them. So it seems there was some decision being made on the size of the bricks, right? The settlements were strategically being set up. For example, if you see Nageshwar and Balakot, uh, if you look at uh, Lothal, for example, which is uh, a port town, um, so that is obviously an indication of some complex being decisions uh, being taken by um, a group of people. We also see that low, uh, labor was mobilized uh, for making bricks and for constructing massive walls and platforms. And um, thousands of laborers were being mobilized. So who was doing that? So who was organizing all these activities? So this definitely hints towards the existence of uh, a political system. But what kind of a political system was it? Uh, we also have statues, very rare statues of priest kings. So what was the nature of the king? So he's called a priest king largely because the early archaeologists who were excavating in this region uh, had been, um, you know, to Mesopotamia. Their first uh, excavations they had done in Mesopotamia. And we know in the Mesopotamian civilization that the king also acted as a chief priest, right? Um, so these early archaeologists named them the chief priest. And we still, uh, sorry, priest king. We uh, still continue to use this nomenclature uh, because of a lack of a better word. We also have the citadel structures like the Great Bath or a structure named as the palace. Um, so perhaps it does indicate that some people were definitely more powerful than the others. Which brings us to the nature of state. So was it a hereditary monarchy? Was there only one person ruling over the entire civilization? Or was it an oligarchy? A group of people ruling the entire empire? Was it a centralized empire? Was it decentralized or were, were there a confederacy of city-states? So these are difficult questions to ask, especially when we look at the high level of standardization right across the civilization. We might assume there was a, a single set of rulers, um, you know, uh, who was ruling over the entire extent of the Harappan civilization. But given the primitive means of transport and communication, um, you know, this uh, were they really able to uh, you know, extend equal levels of control right across the empire. So these are difficult questions to ask, uh, or rather to answer. Questions, of course, we must keep asking, but whether we find an answer to that is always, uh, you know, a problem. Now, how did the civilization end? By 1800 BCE, most mature sites of Cholistan uh, were being abandoned. Cholistan would be the western part of the Harappan civilization. Uh, at the same time, we see an expansion of sites in Gujarat and Western UP, including Haryana. Around 1900 BCE, we do still have a fair number of sites, but uh, you know, 
we do have a disappearance of the distinctive artifacts of the civilization. For example, the standardized weights, the standardized uh, seals and the beads which kind of marked out the Harappan civilization as something unique. Uh, in the later sites, we do not uh, you know, see these artifacts. We also have a decline of long distance trade, a decline of writing and also the quality of constructions. Yes, so this obviously is hinting towards a decline of the civilization. What could have been the causes? Now, many uh, different scholars over the over a period have offered different arguments. Some say that there was climatic change, um, agricultural operations were changing, and people were relocating because earlier regions were now overexploited, uh, and uh, you know the land was not fertile anymore, and they had to move away. Large scale deforestation, some say, led to erosion, and again. Uh, you know, uh, problems in, um, you know, occupation and so on, and they had to move away from there. Some claim that there were excessive flooding. And yes, uh, some of the sites along uh, the river Indus um, do show signs of flooding. Um, others have said the shifting or drying up of rivers, for example, the Saraswati River sort of tends to disappear. Um, uh, you know, there's a Ghagra River, uh, uh, which seems to have disappeared and dried up. Um, or the Indus is changing its course, uh, so which is sort of flooding some of the older uh, sites. Others say overuse of the landscape led to, um, you know, decline of overall quality of life. Others have said the decline of the ruling class or decline of a centralized authority led to the decline of a civilization. And yet others have talked of an invasion theory. But when you're asked this question in the exam, do not name any one uh, cause list all of them and in your conclusion talk about how it may have been a combination of uh, different factors which led to the decline of the civilization as a whole we now come back to how the harappan civilization was discovered so for the longest time in fact in 1924 nobody knew that there was such a civilization in the northwestern part of india so starting with um, cunningham now he was the first director general of the asi his main interest area was the archaeology of the early historic period of India and a little later period. He largely preferred to refer to accounts led by Chinese and Buddhist pilgrims and he trusted the written word more than perhaps archaeological evidence. And when he did come across some of the Harappan seals, he couldn't really place these Harappan seals in, in any of the contexts that he was interested in. Uh, so these seals kept lying in his cupboard till some time later. Um, in the early 20th uh, century, in fact, um, you know, towards the middle of, um, you know, the second decade of the 20th century, Dehram Sahani and Rakhal Das Banerjee, uh, you know, stumbled across Harappa and, and they realized that this was uh, something quite different from what they were familiar with. And they reported this to John Marshall, who then surveyed uh, the sites, uh, excavated this area and announced in 1924 that um, India's history was going to be pushed back by another 3000 years and said that a new civilization and that a new old civilization has been found and he called of course called it the Harap, uh, sorry the indus valley civilization which we today uh, more commonly know as the harappan civilization but there were some problems with uh, john marshall's um, uh, techniques even though he was the first professional archaeologist uh, that uh, the asi had seen um, he was not only uh, interested in spectacular finds, he was also interested in objects of everyday use. Uh, but the problem was that he excavated along horizontal, around, uh, um, along you know, equal horizontal lines without keeping in mind the actual soil stratigraphy. And this led to the loss of very important data for dating the uh, archaeological finds of the Harappan civilization. But this problem was corrected by R.E.M. Wheeler, who uh, joined as Director General of ASI in 1944. He brought in military precision and archaeology. He had worked in the army, um, so um, he was quite disciplined in that sense. And um, he followed the excavation along the stratigraphy of the mount. Yes, so this was a new scientific development in archaeological techniques. So he corrected some of the problems uh, uh, that were uh, created by John Marshall's horizontal uh, excavations, but some of the data, of course, was irreparably lost. Now, uh, what is interesting that after partition, most of the important sites actually uh, uh, were lost to India, to Pakistan. Uh, so the ASI began new explorations in Gujarat, in Haryana, 
in Western UP and Northern Maharashtra, and many new sites since then have been discovered. So the extent of the civilization has now been widened, and new sites like Lokthal, Rakhi Gadhi, Dhola Vira, Kali Bangan have come to the fore. Yeah, so modern day uh, archaeologists are also using modern scientific methods to chemically analyze artifacts which promise that they will throw up some very interesting results. Right, so how do we piece together the past? What are the problems? First problem that we have is of classifying these finds. So how do we classify? How do archaeologists classify finds? Uh, they will uh, look at the material that is being used to uh, manufacture a particular product. They look at the functions that these objects played, uh, whether these products have any resemblance to modern day objects, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the querns, uh, which we use as grinding stones, uh, where was the object found? Was it found inside a drain? Was it found in the hearth region or close to the fireplace of the house? Was it found in the bathroom? Was it found in agrarian fields? Uh, were they found in the middle of the street? Yes, so that also helps uh, the archaeologists classify these finds. We also have a lot of indirect evidence. For example, we may have impression of cloth on clay because cloth is a perishable item. So over these thousands of years, our cloth, all cloth has perished. We really um, uh, do not have any find of actual cloth from the Harappan civilization. But we do have impressions uh, on clay. Uh, so that also uh, gives us some hint about the kind of textiles that were perhaps being used by the Harappan people. Another problem is that of interpretation. How do you interpret, you know, various objects? Uh, for example, if you, um, you know, look at the religion of the Harappans, how do you, uh, how can you find out about what were the religious beliefs like? Now, one artifact, one set of artifacts that we have is terracotta female figurines, which are heavily bejeweled. They have a complex headgear. Uh, so some archaeologists have said that they may be mother goddesses. Um, so that's again open to interpretation. So did they believe in a mother goddess? Uh, what kind of gods and goddesses did they believe in? Uh, we have the priest king. So did the king also perform uh, priestly or religious duties? Again, something that we don't know. What about the great bath of Mohenjo-daro? Was it used for some ritual purpose? Was it just a public bath? What was it? Uh, most scholars today agree that it did have some ritual importance. We also have fire altars uh, in uh, Kali Bangan. Um, so uh, did they worship fire or did they use fire to worship their gods? Again, difficult to, um, uh, you know, interpret. Then we have lots of seals with unicorns or with uh, the representation of people tree. Now, unicorns, of course, are mythical creatures. Uh, we have not found any archaeological evidence of a single horned horse. So it must have been a mythical creature. Uh, now, unicorns are very interesting animals because um, Europe also largely has a lot of, uh, you know, folk, tale, folk tales and myths which are associated uh, with uh, unicorns. Then you have the people tree. Uh, people tree today is considered quite holy by the people. So was it also considered holy by the people of the Harappan civilization? We also have the Pashupati seal. Many uh, scholars argue that this was uh, a representation of early Shiva. But when you look at the representation of Shiva on the seal, it doesn't seem to have a lot of parallels with uh, the Rudra of the Rig Veda. Then we have found some conical stone objects. Now, uh, were, some have argued that these were representations of the Shivlinga. Others have said that these were, uh, you know, gamesmen uh, for various board games that the Harappans uh, may have played. Uh, so that's something uh, very interesting as well. So as you can see, most of these interpretations are only guesses and we really don't have any uh, foolproof evidence to conclusively say that this is how it was in the Harappan civilization, um, at least in terms of religion. Now, let's make some concluding points about the chapter. Um, so one, was the Great Bath a ritual structure? You know, scholars are not in full agreement here. Then the next question is how widespread was literacy? We've seen that uh, scripts have been found engraved on different kinds of material, right from the rims of pottery to uh, you know, a large signpost that we found in Dholavira. Uh, why do Harappan cemeteries show such little social differentiation? Difficult to say. Um, also unanswered are questions on gender. Did women make pottery or did they only paint the pots like they do at present? What about other crafts persons? You know, what about other crafts which are not obvious? For example, weavers. 
um, what were the terracotta female figurines used for? Did they use them to worship or bury them under the ground? What was it? And very few scholars so far have even tried to investigate issues uh, of gender and gender differentiation in the Harappan context. So I hope this segment was useful for you to revise the first chapter in themes of Indian history, bricks, beads and bones. I wish you all the best for your board examinations. If you found this video useful, I would love it if you could like the video and share this with your friends and subscribe to my channel for any further notifications of more videos that I will put up in future. Bye-bye.